The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. For most of the so-called atomic age, governments with nuclear arsenals have been relatively stable and predictable. But are terrorist regimes with nuclear ambitions, such as North Korea and Iran, introducing uncertainty into the way we think about the use of nuclear weapons? To find out, Policy Watch is joined by Tom Schelling, 2005 Nobel Laureate in Economics and Distinguished University Professor at the University of Maryland. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besherov. Tom Schelling, welcome back to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we left off talking about uh, the horrible thought that in the uh, 1950s there were thousands of nuclear weapons in this country and around the world that could be detonated, I won't say at will, but by people other than the rightful owners of those bombs. But let's go to a cheerier topic, which is the idea of North Korea having a nuclear weapon and the ability to deliver it some hundreds of miles away. We won't have to, I don't think we exactly know what kind of delivery system they have or whatever. How worried should we be I know you've said in the past that there's a tremendous taboo against using nuclear weapons and that we should at least in part be reassured by that taboo. Yeah, I think it's astonishing. We've gone more than 60 years since Hiroshima and Nagasaki without any nuclear weapons used in anger. The U.S. didn't use them in Korea, didn't use them in Vietnam. Margaret Thatcher didn't use them in her naval warfare with Argentina. Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel in 1973, the Yom Kippur War, faced two whole Egyptian armies on her side of the Suez Canal, perfect military targets for nuclear weapons, no civilians within 40 or 50 miles. Everybody knew that Israel had nuclear weapons. She didn't use them. And at that time, it wasn't clear that Israel was going to survive, but she didn't use them. And then, to my amazement, the Soviet Union went through a long, dirty, bloody, demoralizing war, a war that may have contributed a lot to the ultimate demise of the Soviet Union. And they didn't use nuclear weapons. As far as anybody knows, they didn't even consider using nuclear weapons. And this that is I, Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. And I think that suggests that there is an abhorrence of nuclear weapons and in, in inhibition on their use that is appreciated even by Soviet leaders, which I wouldn't have expected. Therefore, I rather think that North Koreans or Iranians would recognize that if they break a 60 years, call it a moratorium on the use of nuclear weapons, they're likely to incur the wrath and rage of nearly every country in the world. Surely, if the United Nations is capable of becoming outraged over anything, that's what they would become outraged over if North Korea or Iran used nuclear weapons, except in response to nuclear weapons used against them. But for that to stick, I mean, just to push this a little bit further, if the Koreans, uh, Kim Jong-il, who doesn't seem the most rational fellow in the world, um, if they were to use them, the reaction would have to be pretty overwhelming, wouldn't it? I'm, I'm not sure he's quite as irrational as you think. If you think he's irrational because he wants nuclear weapons, I think he wants nuclear weapons to make sure that he'll never be attacked by the United States. And uh, I can't understand why the United States isn't more willing to try to give at least formal assurances, you know, a non-aggression treaty or something of the sort. I think if he gets nuclear weapons, he will probably quickly discover, no, I won't say probably, I hope he will discover, and I have some thoughts about how to help him discover, that the best thing to use his nuclear weapons for is to deter the United States against ever attacking his country. 
I think he would know that if he ever used nuclear weapons against the United States or against South Korea, he'd, he'd probably be out of business within 48 hours. I want North Korean people who think about nuclear weapons and Iranians who think about weapon, nuclear weapons to get as educated as they can get about what nuclear weapons are good for and what they're not good for. I think if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, it's because it should think this is a way of making sure that the Americans won't attack us, the Russians won't attack us, the Israelis won't attack us. Nuclear weapons are good for deterrence. Now, That's until a, about five years ago, I would have until about five years ago, or, or before Iraq, I would have said, why? We're not going to invade Iran. After Iraq, that becomes a little more likely. So I guess the question is, did the president inadvertently, with his axis of evil speech, send the wrong signal to Korea and Iran that would generate a great, their greater desire to have a bomb? Well, I think his referring to them as the, the axis of evil is more likely to have that effect than any other benign effect I can think of. Yeah, I, if I were an, in the Iranian government, I would be very worried that if the United States ever gets the hell out of Iraq and can start over again, it may go after Iran. And my guess is that their main interest in a nuclear weapon is to see that the U.S. never does anything like that. And uh, now you, mentioned, you mentioned a moment ago that you had some ideas about how to educate them about how to use or not use a nuclear yeah, weapon. Yeah, let me draw the, the, the contrast with India and Pakistan. As I said, Indians and Pakistanis have been reading all of the Western literature on nuclear strategy and all of that, arms control and how to make sure the balance of terror is stable and not unstable and all of that, and how to avoid breaking the distinction between nuclear and non-nuclear weapons. Um, I don't know whether there are any Iranians who have ever been attending the kinds of conferences that Indians and Pakistanis have been attending for 30 or 40 years. Uh, I don't remember any Iranian in London or Aspen, Colorado or any place talking about nuclear weapons policy. Never a North Korean, obviously. And I think it's very important to find a way to make sure that they have access to the kind of thinking about what nuclear weapons are good for and what they're not good for. And uh, it's going to be hard because, you know, uh, any Iranian official who gets into the United States is likely to be confined to the, the New York area around the United Nations headquarters. Uh, I don't think an Iranian diplomat could ever go to Aspen, Colorado to join a, a conference mm -hmm. on the appropriate and inappropriate uses of nuclear weapons. I think we have to find some way that Iranians and North Koreans and maybe Japanese and Indians and Pakistanis and Americans and British can go to some neutral territory, be non-government people, and talk about the experience of having nuclear weapons and what responsibilities they bring. Nuclear weapons can be a real problem if you have them. Because? First, because it may mean that you can become a target of a country that is worried about your nuclear weapons. Partly because, unless you are, are, are as stable as I think India is, you don't know who's going to get hold of the weapons in case of some kind of internal difficulty. And there's the problem. If you give your weapons to the army and the army isn't loyal, you're in trouble. If you withhold the weapons from the army, the army will believe you don't trust the army and they're more likely to be less loyal. I think it's a hard decision to whom you entrust the nuclear weapons. The, the, the Soviets, for decades, didn't let their nuclear warheads be under the custody of military officers. They were all political commissars. But essentially, they had a nuclear weapons custody program that was separate from the military services. And unlike the USA, they never let any airplanes fly outside their borders with nuclear weapons on board. We had a thing called Airborne Alert back in the, in the 1960s, 
US airplanes would fly over the North Pole with nuclear weapons on board. Nobody ever worried that Americans would land the airplanes in some place and sell the bombs on the black market. But the Soviets never trusted their military with nuclear warheads, with the incomprehensible exception of Cuba. There were, now, we're told that there were nuclear weapons, tactical weapons there. Now, is that right? We, we're told that in... We are told. We are told. You, that implies you don't necessarily believe that they were there. I have never believed that there were live warheads on the intermediate range missiles in Cuba. I just can't imagine that Khrushchev would ever have allowed nuclear warheads to be available to Cubans or even to army colonels and generals. We've been talking about governments and um, the idea of rational actors in governments rings true to me. But I have difficulty when I think about some of the terrorist groups that we read about, not just Al-Qaeda, but others as well. They seem to be in a different world, almost on a different planet. How much can we understand from either game theory or your other analysis what they're thinking and what they might do, not just with a nuclear weapon, because I understand how difficult it would be to operational, for them to operationalize a nuclear weapon, but there are biological weapons, there are uh, dirty bombs, there are all sorts of things that they could do that would be somewhat catastrophic for um, those of us in the U.S. or in Western Europe. There have been a long history of the possibility of nuclear weapons being stolen, and I think as far as has ever been disclosed, no nuclear weapons are missing from where they're supposed to be. Not from the Soviet Union, not from the United States. Um, so I think probably if a terrorist group were to get a nuclear weapon, they would get some black market fissile material enriched uranium, maybe plutonium. They, they prefer enriched uranium because plutonium is very dangerous stuff to handle. And, uh, and I think in order to build a nuclear weapon, they're going to have to get some very knowledgeable scientists from different fields and some very excellent technologists. And they're going to have to get some very high quality materials and they're going to have to get all of these people and all these materials in some secret location away from their families, away from their jobs, where for a period of what I would estimate to be months, but at least many weeks, they're going to be working secretly to put together some kind of a bomb or a couple of bombs. What are they going to talk about? All they're going to talk about is what are these things going to be good for? What are they going to be used for? Do we have any influence over their use? Are we doing this for money? Are we doing it for Patriotism, are we doing it because we're committed terrorists? And what are these weapons going to be good for? And I have a hunch, I'm being optimistic now, I'm hoping that they will be smart enough to realize that what these things are good for is for deterrence. You go blow up Los Angeles or Hamburg or Glasgow, there goes your weapon. What did you do? You killed a lot of people. Did you make any friends? Did it make you any money? On the other hand, if you can think of some government that may be thinking of doing something you don't want them to do, letting them know, if you can demonstrate it, that you have a nuclear weapon may be a wonderful way to deter what you didn't want them to do. Um, uh, it's, it's worth imagining, s s suppose Saddam Hussein had had nuclear weapons, not just the nuclear weapons program that we might discover and dismantle by invading, but if he'd had nuclear weapons and if he had been able to invite the International Atomic Energy Agency in, not to see that he was free of nuclear weapons, but to see that he had nuclear weapons and if he could... And that he had Scud missiles to shoot them at Israel. Well, if he had them that on a fishing boat he could put in a U.S. harbor. That's the delivery system that I think is most reliable for a country like Iraq. But if, if he'd actually had a few nuclear weapons and could prove that he had them and that they were good, I think he could have told the United States that he had nuclear weapons 
he could even see that he had three nuclear weapons in U.S. cities already. And I think the U.S. would have tried very hard to discern whether that was true and then to think about whether we really wanted to invade. Uh, he didn't have them, but I think even a terrorist organization might decide nuclear weapons are better to deter military action by a country like the United States than to just go blow up half a million people. Would you say the same about biological weapons, which well, are easier to fabricate? Well, you have to be careful about biological weapons. There used to be a lot of interest in smallpox. It seems to have disappeared, and I, I may know the reason why. But the thing about smallpox is if you ever were, were a terrorist and you started a smallpox epidemic in the United States, it would be in Cairo, in Beijing, in Paris, in, uh, in Baghdad, in Tehran, in St. Petersburg, within a few weeks. It would be a global epidemic. And probably the havoc would be vastly greater in the poor countries, the developing countries, than in the developed countries. Probably most developing countries wouldn't be able to diagnose smallpox if they saw it. They don't have any capability to quarantine people who get smallpox. They don't have any medical care for people with smallpox. Uh, t take an example. Suppose a Palestinian terrorist had smallpox. Could he afford to let it loose in Israel? No. Israel, which may have vaccine for all I know, Israel has the capability to, court, to diagnose smallpox, quarantine smallpox patients, uh, provide the best modern medical care to any smallpox patients. But think about the poor Palestinians, of whom tens of thousands work in Israel, and a million Arabs who are Israeli citizens in Israel. The, the smallpox effect on, on the West Bank and Gaza would be vastly more horrendous even than it would be in Israel, just because you can't control the damn disease. Therefore, I think I wanted a couple of years ago to find a way to make sure that any terrorist who thought he could get hold of smallpox should realize that this would really be mutual assured destruction. Now, what other that suggests to me that they want to use, if they want to use biological weapons, they want to use non-contagious disease weapons. But then the question arises, why do they want to make Americans sick? Are they really interested in, in the fact that Americans may die, or do they want to do something heroic, like the people who flew airplanes into the Twin Trade Towers? Terrorists have to think about what are they going to gain by letting loose a disease? Is that a heroic way to attack enemies, or is that just a way to go around making women and children miserable? So I'm not sure that they're interested, because if, if they want if what they want is emulation, if they want recruits, if they want money and so forth, this is a rather ugly way to go about killing people. Now, most of what you've said and, and the conclusions that you've reached is not just reassuring because of the conclusion that you reach, but because you suggest that the world is, and the people in it, even the apparently bad actors, are rational. So... How rational do you think the world is, not just the terrorists? Or is there a place for irrationality in, sure. in your analysis? Sure, there's a lot of room for irrationality. It is now well known that President Reagan's wife spoke by telephone with a fortune teller in Los Angeles in order to decide whether she should let her husband travel by airplane. If you walk up Madison Avenue, as I did recently, there's at least one fortune teller in every block. And every newspaper I ever read, except for the New York Times, has the daily horoscope. Okay. <laughs> Take me to Iran okay, with this story. Okay, Take okay. me to Iran. Now, you want to know rationality. I think the 19 guys who did what they did on September 11th were about as rational as you could get. They were able to make their plans. They were able to avoid drunken misdemeanors. They were able to avoid giving anything away. They were able to stick to a plan. They were able to plan carefully. They were able to learn how to fly airplanes. And they picked a superlative target from their point of view. 
Now, you can say it's irrational to hate Americans so much that you want to kill thousands of them by using airplanes as bombs in New York. But if what you want to do is make a demonstration, A, that we are capable, that we are heroic, we're not cowards, and the United States is vulnerable, uh, we are performing an admirable feat, they really did it. And I think that's about as rational as you can get. Now, if, if you want to say it's irrational to hate Americans, okay, but... Uh, no, no, I just wanted to see how much irrationality you found in, in the world. Oh, I find a lot of it. On the other hand, most people are rational enough not to want to lose their lives, not to want to be maimed or dismembered or have to suffer. Most people are rational enough not to want their families to suffer. And uh, uh, you can talk about the irrationality of various religious objectives, whether in the United States or in Iran. Uh, there, there are some people who are, I've been reading think that the president of Iran almost dreams of a Goethe Demerung where he would like to destroy his enemies even at the expense of destroying himself because there's an afterlife that he may believe in. Uh, my hunch is that when it's time to make a decision, a military decision, the leaders of Iran are not going to want to do something that will wipe out Iran or its leadership. Before we leave this topic, um, you mentioned about the World Trade Center and the rationality of attacking the Trade Center. It's now been a number of years since then, and as far as we know, there have been no major attempts to do something on a similar scale in the U.S. On the assumption that that's true, that things haven't happened, that the American government has stopped and just not told us about, which doesn't seem too likely since the president would be eager to tell us about some serious successes. What do you suppose would be the reasoning uh, behind not taking a truck filled with explosives and stopping under the Lincoln Tunnel, for example, and blowing it up? I can only assume that there aren't many terrorists in the United States who want to do that kind of thing. Terrorism, by and large, over the last 20 or 30 years, has done remarkably little damage. Even the Twin Trade Towers were equivalent to three weeks' worth of automobile fatalities in the United States. Even in Israel, automobile fatalities vastly outweigh terrorist fatalities. You, you can get uh, Australians terribly concerned about the bombing of a nightclub in Bali that was frequented by Australians. But you know, probably more Australians die by falling down stairs in a decade than would ever be killed in a terrorist attack. Uh, I, I wrote something about 15 years ago in, indicating that as far as I could tell, terrorists had rarely done any real damage anywhere in the world and they had almost never uh, accomplished anything by their terrorism. I, I worried a little about whether that was going to be true of North Ireland. Um, but uh, even now, I would say, considering how vulnerable everybody in this country is to simple assassination, to your bomb in the Lincoln Tunnel, to a hand grenade in the Washington Metro. To the Washington Sniper a few years ago. Well, the Washington Snipers illustrate the ability of Americans and probably people everywhere to get terribly scared of vivid images of a kind of danger. Now here in a territory, the Washington metropolitan area of about three million people, I believe 13 people were shot, of whom I believe 11 or 12 died. And the whole area was terrorized. You know, there were gasoline stations that put up tarpaulins so nobody could, no terrorists could see who was filling his car with gasoline. I know those gas stations well. <laughs> yeah. I had a very good friend who was going to come and spend the weekend with me who decided not to come until the terrorists had been caught. You know, he, 
go anywhere, the, the risk of being hit by one of those terrorists is minuscule, but it, it, it has the capacity to grip the imagination of people. And I think that so, something about President Bush's war on terrorism suggests that to him, thinking about terrorism makes it almost like living under the shadow of Soviet hydrogen bomb missiles for all of those years of the Cold War. You know, we really had an enemy back then. Uh, the idea that terrorism is, is the new version of, a, of that kind of situation just seems to me doesn't stand up to examination. Let me just say to our viewers, if they want to contact us, you can email us at policywatch.umd, that's UMD for University of Maryland, dot edu. Tom Schelling, thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.